So people have been talking about the exclusive details on Sony's brand new next-gen PlayStation based on this article from Wired, which is an interview with the system's architect Mark Cerny. I don't usually talk hardware on this channel, but I do want to talk about this one in particular because from what I'm reading and hearing from so many people about the specs, I am pressing X on this. Or is it square, technically, because it's PlayStation? Anyway, before we press square to doubt, I want to say huge thanks for liking and sharing my videos, subscribing and following me on social media, and for supporting me on Patreon, PayPal, and many other means. Links down below. Also, huge thanks to Crispy Bacon and oh boy, I cannot read that for a donation. Um, Kong-san? Regardless, you are fantastic. Ah, the next-gen consoles. Who do you guys think really won this current generation of consoles? Of course, the PC still reigns supreme, which is why I'm talking about consoles specifically. Who do you guys think won the current-gen console war? For me, the winner has to be the Nintendo Switch. I mean, sure, it's not exactly the most powerful console in the bunch, but it manages to outwit the standard and frankly dated model of consoles that we've seen many times before with an innovative portable-slash-console hybrid. PS4 was second only because there exclusives are good and the controller is really good but that's pretty much it xbox well the controller is good the performance of the xbox one x is easily the best out of all of them but no good exclusives and no reason for anyone to buy it now i as part of the multi-platform monarchy don't really have a lot of issues with playing games that are not exclusively on the xbox one which is good because there aren't a lot of games that are exclusive on the xbox one and yet at this moment i kind of feel like the consoles are turning into simplified pcs for the bit <clears throat> Knights, yes, the console order. They are still warriors contributing for the real gaming market instead of those filthy mobile gaming peasants. Point is, people are starting to turn the consoles into a PC, or at least the Xbox One into the PC, what with the mouse and keyboard support that they've been getting. So if the consoles are turning into a PC, well, they are technically PCs, why do we need them in the first place? Is it really designed for the console knights who merely want to pick up the sword and fight instead of the nobles who also have to think about maintaining the budgets for their ivory towers and the monarchs who also have to control their entire kingdoms? This comparison sounds a lot more apt than I thought. So can the PS5 be Sony's ultimate weapon in beating the console war once and for all? I wouldn't be too sure of that. I mean, spec-wise, it sounds like a very powerful system, and it's probably gonna be released around two years from now, but we still don't know the capabilities of the hardwares of those systems because, well, they haven't been released yet. And not only that, but if you look at it in the perspective of two years from now, it actually sounds less impressive. Let's check out the Wired article and examine the specs a little bit closer. The CPU is going to be using an AMD Ryzen chip based on the Zen 2 7 nanometer microarchitecture. According to a leak from Adore TV, which keep in mind that this isn't confirmed yet, it's probably going to be on par with the Ryzen 5 3600 lineups of CPUs, which will cost about $178 MSRP, on the cheapest model. We'll get to pricing later because, well, that is also an issue for me. As for the GPU, it's going to be a custom variant of AMD's Radeon Navi, which apparently will support ray tracing, even though Navi itself wouldn't as far as I know. If you don't know what ray tracing is, it's essentially a real-time rendering method that allows for more realistic and accurate reflections of objects. So how well will Navi support ray tracing? That's a very good question, considering that Nvidia's own RTX lineup of GPUs are not really that good in handling ray tracing, and they're the ones making the best of the best GPUs. The PS5 having an 8-core, possibly 16-thread Zen 2 Ryzen chip is believable, but having ray tracing with good performance sounds like a dream to me. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe AMD could provide us with a custom Navi GPU that allows us to do ray tracing with minimal performance loss. Can AMD build GPUs that leap pretty far ahead of their current GPU lineups the same way they did with their CPU lineups? I mean, FX to Ryzen is quite the leap if you ask me. Anyway, one of the biggest innovation on a brand new PS5, which is something that the PC and the mobile already had for years now, was the switch to SSDs. I mean, it is technically possible to use an SSD on a PS4, the same way it is technically possible for a professional cyclist to ride a tricycle, but both of those need a platform that allows them to perform fast and efficient. While there are performance benefits on using an SSD in a PS4, it's really not enough to justify the upgrade. They did test the new Spider-Man with their experiment 
experimental model, and it highlights how the PS5 uses the SSD really damn well compared to PS4's slow optical hard drive. It manages to reduce fast travel loading times that range from 15 seconds using a normal hard drive to 0.8 seconds using an SSD. The question right now is, will the SSD be soldered to the motherboard, or will it be removable like the PS4, which allows for future upgradability? Will it be using M.2 NVMe SSDs, or just the standard SATA, whether it be M.2 or the traditional 2.5 inch drive? Apparently, the raw bandwidth is higher than any other SSDs available on a PC, which will probably mean that it's either a soldered SSD storage or they're using a brand new interface to make sure that the bandwidth, the read, and write speeds are faster. Still, can you really beat NVMe's raw speed though? Or will it be just NVMe? We'll see. And speaking of Spider-Man, you might notice that Spider-Man is a PS4 title, and that's another reason why the PS5 might be really good for those who don't own a PS4. You are able to play a relatively large lineup of PS4 games on the brand new console. Not only that, but the game still retains its physical Blu-ray reader, and you're able to just put in your PS4 titles and install them normally. Hopefully these games can perform better with the PS5, with higher frame rates, and that 100% of the PS4 titles would be backwards compatible, not just a select few. But that's the thing, isn't it? What I define as good here is something that they should have done a long time ago. They're slowly progressing into what the current gen PCs can already do now, and they won't even release the console until the next two to three years. And this brings me to the price. Now they haven't talked about the price here yet, but the question here is, how is the PS5 going to put all of those hardwares for around $300 to $500? If you build a system like that with similar specs today, it would cost around a thousand dollars. Now, I'm just speculating here, but I think the answer is that they're using current year hardware, which will be cheaper in the next two to three years. And you know what that means? That means that the PS5's hardwares will probably be dated by the time it's released. Considering how incredibly fast hardwares have evolved in this generation, the PS5 would be really impressive today, but Probably not in the next two years. If you guys need an illustration and how fast hardwares have evolved, the new Zen 2 Ryzen lineups are already including 16 core 32 thread CPUs, at least according to the leaks. The very first Ryzen lineups began in around March 2017. Two years ago, people are seeing 8 core 16 thread CPUs as the new mainstream. Intel's own Coffee Lake lineups of CPUs were also released in October that year, and their flagship, the 87 700K was a 6 core 12 thread CPU. Their Coffee Lake refresh was released last year, and their flagship, the 9900K, was an 8 core 16 thread CPU. Do you see how fast hardwares are evolving these past few years? And you know what would also evolve in the next two years? Video game graphics and other technologies, which will use more and more resources. So we could arrive in a time where the PS5 could play the latest Demand in AAA titles, but not at an optimal 60 FPS because they're using hardwares that were only impressive today and these demanding titles are basing their games using hardwares of the future. It's quite weird that I'm skeptical with the specs but also not surprised with the specs. It sounds impressive today and the skepticism comes at being able to deliver all of that performance at a sub $500 price. But that is if I look at it in current year perspective. If I look at the specs for the next 2 or 3 years, I am actually not surprise. I think you will be able to build a system with 8 core CPU and ray tracing GPU in the next two years at a sub $500 price. We don't know. But while I do believe that the hardware is going to be capable of playing 2019 and prior games at optimal frame rates, I do not believe that it will be able to play future titles at that frame rate. To put it in perspective, the PS4 and Xbox One are beginning to struggle to play the latest demanding titles. Metro Exodus, for example, runs at 30 FPS in all versions of the PS4 and Xbox One, and not a consistent one at that. If the PS5 has an 8 core CPU with hyper threading like the Core i9-9900K and a really damn good ray tracing GPU like the RTX 2080 Ti, it will be able to play Metro Exodus at 4K 60 FPS. FPS, with RTX turn off that is. But here's the thing, the game is going to be 2 years old by the time the PS5 is released. My question here is, will the PS5 be able to handle titles that are even more demanding than Metro with 
two-year-old hardwares. Maybe there will be titles out there that really push the boundaries of the PS5 graphics, but that would put the PS5 as the subpar 30 FPS cinematic experience that works fine, just not as optimal, like the last console. It will destroy PS4 titles for sure, but I don't think it will destroy its own titles. Meanwhile, the PC is slowly but surely evolving. I know that this is just pure speculation on my part, but this is one of my biggest doubts that I have with the PS5. I am skeptical on the specs, but I am more skeptical on how optimal it will be for the next two to three years in handling games. I have no doubts that it will be able to handle PS4 titles just fine at better frame rates and faster loading times, but will it be able to handle future titles as well in the same performance? Will it be able to at least match next-gen PCs, which would probably already have 32 cores, 64 threads, and better ray tracing GPUs? Thankfully, considering that the knights at the console orders only care about playing games in those platforms, the PS5 should be able to just suit them well. I mean, if they actually care about performance, they'd be jumping to the proud PC nobility. But still, the Wired article says that the generational transition would be a gentle one, meaning that we're probably not going to be seeing the PS5 exclusive titles, or at least the ones that would really sell the system. These future titles are going to be released both on the PS4 and the PS5, and Death Stranding could potentially be one of them. So for those console knights who want to transition to the PS5, it's highly recommended that you don't do that at release. But that's another thing that I fear. Since the transitional period is going to be a gentle one, and since we don't know what other selling points that the PS5 would have, I'm not really sure if people are going to buy them at launch. Will people actually buy the PS5 on launch when they're using dated hardwares? Will people actually buy the PS5 when they're censoring games left and right in the name of politics and protecting children? The more and more I look at the PS5, the more and more skeptical I become on its revolutionary traits. However, I do want to see DualShock 5 so that I can use them on my PC. So anyway, what else can we know from the Wired article? Apparently, we know that ray tracing implementations will also be able to add more realistic audio, which sounds a lot more like Dolby Atmos' implementation of sound that was object-based instead of channel-based. I'll link to TechQuickie's video if you're confused in what I'm talking about. I do like my spatial awareness in my video games, especially sound-wise. It does provide a competitive advantage, but if you're going to have more spatial awareness in the sound department, we need to have proper support for surround sound systems and also surround headsets like the ones that I'm using right now, which is the Logitech G633. In conclusion, I think that the PS5 is going to the right direction on improving a lot of its predecessor's fault, at least on paper, but I fear that it's going to be the same underperforming console that the PS4 was. Computer hardwares have evolved in a surprisingly rapid pace, and I highly doubt that the PS5 will be able to evolve in a manner that would match up the PCs of the next two to three years. Years, the proud PC nobilities are able to catch up with the latest hardware trends and upgrade their PC parts little by little, while the console knights had to buy entirely new consoles for their upgrades, one that I still think would underperform in the future. But honestly, it depends on what type of games that the AAA gaming industry wants to make. As a multi-platform monarch, I personally see no value in upgrading my PS4 to the PS5 at launch. The only thing that I'd be upgrading will be my controller, and hopefully we can see better PC support for those. If the PlayStation 5 is launched, there is nothing wrong with holding your old PS4 for at least a year or so. If there are actually good exclusive titles on a PS5 like Persona 6 or something, then maybe you might want to make the purchase. However, if you're a fan of fan service anime games or games with sexual content, if you're not jumping on PC or the Nintendo Switch already, what are you doing? You are doing yourself a disservice of buying any of Sony's puritanical consoles if you are aiming for that sexual content. I'd recommend to avoid the PlayStation at all costs. You'll be happy with your PC and Switch for at least the next 5 years. Unless if we're talking about VR waifus, which in that case, you might want to consider a hardware upgrade or just make one out of cardboard.